Perfect. So welcome to Map System 2023, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today and um, for making time to be part of the programme. Uh, we appreciate that your time is extremely precious and you're all very busy people. Uh, so thank you for being here. So today I'm delighted uh, to be joined um, by my colleagues, um, Dr. Peter Drobak, um, Callum Pinters is in the room with me, I've got other colleagues who are here online watching, um, and we're also very um, honoured to be joined by uh, Dr. Francois Benici, who is going to be speaking to us um, shortly uh, to kind of launch this whole concept of, of system change and systems thinking, uh, which some of you might already be very familiar with, some of you might be brand new, it doesn't matter, map, map system is going to help you regardless of where you're starting from. And then at the end of the session, uh, I'm going to go through just some more logistical details, pointing out how to navigate Canvas, the upcoming live sessions, um, just to help you um, have the best start you can with Map System. So I'm going to um, pass over to Peter now. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. I hope you can all hear me well. Yes, great. Um, welcome to Map the System. Um, thanks for tuning in from all over the world. I'm just uh, I'm loving the chat here. Nepal, Papua New Guinea, um, Habana, Botswana, um, US, UK, etc. This is why we love um, Map the System. It's it, it's grown to become such an incredibly vibrant community from from all over the world. And uh, you know, all of these big global problems we talk about are local uh, are local issues first. And there's a huge amount that we can learn from one another. As you can see here on the screen, this is a this is a shot from our global final last year, which was the first time we were able to convene in person with um, finalists from around the world, and we had a blast. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing many of you in person um, come uh, come July this year. Um, uh, but really looking forward to the journey we're about to take um, together. Uh, so as you can see here, this is Map the System's biggest year yet. We're in our, I think, eighth, seventh or eighth year, um, and it's grown from just a handful of institutions, uh, Oxford and Canada mostly. So now you can see, um, you know, over 60 partner institutions in 27 countries uh, representing every continent almost. Um, South America, we, we're still working on the University of Antarctica as well. Um, that'll be uh, that'll be for next year, I suppose. Um, you know, we have a lot of um, uh, institutions returning. And so for those educators who are out there, great to see you. Um, thanks as ever for your support and partnership on this. Um, and for those 17 new institutions, we're thrilled to have you on board here. Um, but as you can see, this is a this is now a large community of um, of uh, uh, of social impact educators uh, around the world. And that's become a nice community of practice. And of course, there are, are thousands of us as learners who are participating this year. Um, it's gonna be really good fun. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just a bit about the, the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship. Um, we're based here in Oxford. Um, we serve the university and as much as we can the rest of the world. Um, we're nearly 20 years old, so just almost as long as social entrepreneurship has been a thing, um, the, the, the Skoll Center has been here. And, uh, you know, we exist to make social entrepreneurship a force for good in the world. Um, but that is a very broad approach to social entrepreneurship. We talk about entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, and extrapreneurs um, as the sort of systems leaders who orchestrate large scale change. And, and, and so we, we try to equip entrepreneurial leaders for impact, um, not only within business as we are in a business school, but of course, well beyond and oftentimes across sectors. And we do this next slide through um, impact education programs, through, um, uh, through research and through convening. Um, this again mentions that we're about 20 years old. <laughs> Excuse me. And, um, and we've partnered with the Skoll Foundation um, out in California for that entire time. And, uh, you know, they've been such key actors in helping to mainstream um, social entrepreneurship as a, as a vocation. When I was your age, um, this was not necessarily a thing that anybody was talking about. Certainly nobody in my university when I was an undergraduate was saying you could go be a social entrepreneur. Um, the world has changed a lot and thank goodness. And, uh, um, and I think amongst many, many others, the School Foundation deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, and uh, we're, we're grateful to, to partner with them. Next slide. 
Um, so Map the System is one part of our impact education portfolio. Um, as you can imagine, we do a lot of work um, to train the next generation of social entrepreneurs um, here in Oxford, um, as well as a program called the Impact Lab for Impact Leaders uh, across the university. And Map the System is really an effort to um, take some of these learnings and, um, and, 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 and a bit of what we do in the classroom here in Oxford to the rest of the world. And as you'll see, it's a competition, a social innovation competition, but really it's a it's a learning program and a learning community more than anything else um love to talk to you more about what we do um we're we're privileged to co-host the skull world forum um, for social innovation here in oxford every year in april um, we will be back in 2023 in person for the first time since COVID hit and i'm really looking forward to that there is going to be a lot of um, um online presence of the forum again this year. Um, we had a lot of global participation the last couple of years for obvious reasons and really want to keep that up. Um, so if you want to learn more about the Skoll World Forum, uh, be in touch with us, check out our website or skoll.org. Um, and we can always chat more about some of the stuff we do as we as we go along. But let's turn to map the system. Next slide. Um, so I think you all know Map the System is this wonderful social innovation competition that sort of grew out of the, the realization that a lot of um, social business competitions and social venture competitions um, we're sort of prioritizing easy solutions or seemingly easy solutions to what oftentimes were were very deep and complex problems um, and, and oftentimes fostered a sort of a tech focused and, and sometimes top down approach that in the real world for those of us who have been engaged in this work for a long time um, rarely is sort of up to the task um, and that the work of driving systems transformation is one that is bottom up that is collaborative um, that requires a learning mindset and most importantly under requires a deep understanding of the complexities and the interdependencies and the different perspectives and the, the power dynamics within the system. And we believe that uh, being able to work with a systems lens um, to be able to understand the invisible architecture and the root causes of the problems and also all of the different interdependencies, what you look at as a health problem might in fact be um, an education issue or an economic issue or a poverty issue or a race issue, all of those things are interconnected. We feel like being able to take that lens and being able to zoom in and zoom out is, um, is really an important edge, um, is a source of innovation and creativity and new ideas for change and can at least be begin the work of, um, uh, of becoming the sort of change maker who can drive sustained and transformational change. And, and I'm sure we'll hear more from Francois about what that all takes. But this is hopefully the beginning of that journey for you. And we want you to learn by doing. Um, there's a brilliant um, online curriculum and a lot of uh, live sessions we'll be doing together. Um, but ultimately, this is a chance for you to dig into an issue that you care about, to raise awareness about it, to bring new people into your network, and, um, and hopefully to catalyze you know, your journey to making change. Um, so why do we need Map the System? I, I mean, I, I guess it's sort of obvious and, and, um, and I sort of already touched on it, but if you think about where we are in, in 2023, you'll hear things like the, the, the three C's, COVID, climate and conflict. Um, we're, we're, we've been kind of living for the last several years in this, um, this kind of collision of intersecting um, systemic crises. And, um, and, you know, for many of us, I think that COVID was a bit of a wake up call that systems are invisible until something goes wrong. And you realize actually how fragile um, systems can be and that we just can't go back to the way things were. Um, that we, you know, this hopefully this difficult period we've all been living through is an opportunity to build something a little bit better and to think about what kind of world we, we ultimately want to live in. Um, and I think that's really important. The other thing is that I think, you know, for, as I said, many of us who were finding that some of the challenges of the last couple of years and realizing that systems we took for granted um, were actually fragile and sometimes harmful. Um, the reality is that um, there are a lot of people who already were suffering and were excluded um, for a long time before. And so, so I think it's a wake up call for some and it's a long overdue reckoning for those who've been working in this space um, and on the hard edges of society for a long time. Um, but ultimately, we believe that we need deep systemic change. And we believe that, again, this is a terrific set of tools for, um, for innovation, creativity, and change. And Map the System will be just a first step 
The idea is that by exploring and understanding the complexities of the system, uh, you can generate ideas for how to, um, to implement change, but the actual hard work of creating that change is gonna be a process that you'll be engaged with, I hope, for your entire lives. Next slide. Um, so a little bit about map, what happens sort of beyond map the system, what students have gone on and done. Um, again, we're not trying to train specifically one kind of professional or just social entrepreneurs. You're all here because you care about your place in the world and you care about um, leaving the world better than you found it. Um, and I think that's what we're all here to do in some way, shape or form. Um, folks who have been a part of this program have gone on to um, continue their research um, uh, in their own studies um, or beyond that. Um, many of them have gone on to work for their universities or others and become educators um, in our programs. And we have a number of them now as part of our community. Um, many have gone on to launch ventures, whether NGOs or social ventures or other things that came from um, an idea that they developed um, uh, in, in Map the System. Um, uh, you know, the prize money has been used for lots of different things, but oftentimes people just want to dig into this further and they've used this to kind of carry on their work. Um, and we've seen folks go on into all different sorts of roles. We know that some of you are undergraduates and at very early stages and they have several years of studies yet ahead of you. Others might be masters or even PhDs um, and are going out into the world. Um, so we've seen all sorts of things. And this is what we need from impact leaders. We need impact leaders who are working in the private sector, in the public sector, in the third sector. We need, um, we need impact leaders who are driving change through community mobilization, activism, through social ventures, as intrapreneurs in large firms, et cetera. Um, it, it takes all kinds. And I think one of the lessons of systems work is in fact that there's no single idea, there's no single individual or organization um, that can drive that change on their own. We need collective action. And, uh, and so we, we need to infect all of these spaces. Um, so the, the, the last thing I wanna say here is that there's, there's an opportunity I think in map the system because it's a sort of a classroom exercise if you will um, to really think outside the box and to be audacious. And so what I would encourage you to do is, um, is continually test your preconceptions, allow others to challenge your preconceptions and mental models, cast aside notions you may have now about how to address these problems. Um, but as you're pushing forward, we're gonna ask you to sort of, uh, to articulate a guiding star um, for where you'd like to get to and what success would look like what is that ideal system state? What does the world look like if we get some things right? And I want to invite and encourage you to continually ask yourselves, are we being bold enough? Um, are we being audacious enough? And to you know, really understand that the sky's the limit. And um, you know, unless we get a little crazy sometimes, we're not gonna be able to make um, uh, you know, deep change. Um, so the map system journey, as you can see here, I think this is on the website as well. Um, uh, we, we tried to break the break the journey up into these kinds of phases, the foundation phase, where we learn some of the basics of systems thinking, and then also come together in your groups to really scope out and um, uh, and, and, and try to delineate the, the boundaries of your projects and what you're trying to do. And then we move into the flare phase and the focus phase. And this um, articulates the, the experience of a systems exploration where it's an open-ended one. And as you just begin to dig into the system and look at it from different perspectives, you find an almost overwhelming amount of information that answering one question will lead to three more. We want you to lead into that ambiguity um, and allow yourself to, um, to explore a little bit and to, to wander around in the system and in the problem. And, and as you work through the process, you'll begin to understand what are those things that really matter. And this is where the mapping can really come in and help with that. Um, and that focus phase is when you start to understand these are some of the key factors that are holding our current system in place. Here are some of the leverage points where we think a little change can start to make a big difference. And that's ultimately gonna lead you to, we hope some really creative system shifting ideas. Um, ultimately by the end of March, or in fact, I guess the 3rd of April, um, you'll be submitting your projects and then onto the competition phase of things where we have local finals at your institutions, um, a virtual semifinals round, which is new this year because we've just gotten too big. Um, and then ultimately the global final here in Oxford in, uh, in July of this year.
Yeah. And that's my that's my warm up. Um, uh, there's there's a lot to do, and as if you haven't already been on the Canvas site, um, you'll see that there is a lot of really good information there. Um, uh, Alice will go through this a little bit later. This is a self directed journey. It is what you make of it, um, and we're really excited to go on this journey with you. Uh, we have a lot of support coming out of Oxford, uh, both through live sessions and through our network of um, Oxford based mentors. But of course, within your own institutions, um, you have tremendous um, educators and others that you can call on and lean on. We look forward to, to learning with you. Um, and with that, and speaking of learning, I want to introduce um, someone that I've learned a lot from um, over the years, and that is our pal, uh, Dr. Francois Benici. Um, Francois is a, a, is a doctor uh, like me who's gone on into many, many other things. He's currently um, the head of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, and so he's just coming off of a very busy time um, during the, the World Economic Forum. He is himself a social entrepreneur. He is an academic, he is an author, he is a change maker, he's a foundation leader, a thought leader, et cetera. Um, the most important thing I think to say about Francois is that even when he's been in academic roles, he's always been deeply engaged in practice um, and in communities and being one of those people who can navigate um, multiple different worlds. Um, he was the founding director of the Bertha Center for Social Innovation, one of our key partners here. And importantly, is the co-author with Cynthia Rayner of uh, the Systems Work uh, of Social Change, which is, I think, one of the best and most practical books on this topic. And um, uh, we're, we're grateful to him for, for being here um, with us today. So please welcome uh, Francois. Thank you, Peter. And hello to everyone. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Peter, as you said, uh, it's a learning community and I've certainly learned from the work. Uh, well, actually starting at Oxford, I was thinking, Next year will be 20 years. So I think I was there as the Skoll Center was starting. So um, just grateful for the journey of learning from others. And what excites me about Map the System and, and meeting all of you here is exactly what you were saying, Peter, that it's actually a learning community rather than a competition. And I think that's actually what's going to create system change. No single solution, no single actor, no single person. Uh, and they've I think the, the, the field of social entrepreneurship has emerged and evolved into that mindset. Whereas maybe 20 years ago, we were thinking about what is the best solution, best business model, best product, best service that's going to have the greatest number of impact and how do we scale it to a point where we realize we need to understand the complexity of the places and context and uh, issues that we're working in um, as we work in them. Not to say to do nothing and, and stop and, and don't start, but to rather recognize that you know a starting point is actually research uh, and i think this is quite different as as a community and as a competition from many other social business plans and pitches and things and this is why i've been excited by it and i think have been involved since the very first year and and the birth center has been been long involved with it as well um in that spirit of recognizing that that the the necessity of, of diving deep of research of listening uh, of learning. So just incredible what's been achieved and how many people are here from all over the world. So I'm just so excited to be part of this community. So thanks to you and, and to the Skull Center team and to Alison Bronwyn and everyone for, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to share a couple of thoughts and I, you know, like all of us, my kind of early um, comments will be that in some ways we see systems all around us and we all are part of them. And so some of this comes very naturally, I think, to human beings who are all part of systems. Um, and some of it, there is, you know, quite several layers of academic thinking uh, and practice that we need to learn from, but not be overwhelmed by. And so just kind of appealing to everyone to say it's, it's a learning journey uh, together. And there's um, a, a lot of it is common sense, but it requires time reflection uh, to, to do the work. So uh, without uh, too much further ado, I'm going to take you through uh, some slides and also ask for your input uh, and uh, your ideas as we go through this. Um, so I will start by sharing some uh, slides with you all. So uh, as Peter said, uh, I'm Francois. Uh, I'm South African. You may hear by the accent for those of you who know the accent, um, but I currently live in Switzerland. Um, so I'll just share some, some mounted views with you all uh, and the Schwab Foundation, as Peter said, the organization of the World Economic Forum, where I also work 
uh, and Peter, like you, we're also celebrating a little uh, a little milestone of of twenty five years. So uh, that's exciting um, to be able to sustain, like the school centre, sustained this topic and grown this topic in the institution of Oxford. Uh, so should I go um, of the surface of, uh, of the World Economic Forum? Um, Good. Well, let's dive in. And funnily enough, Peter and I did not <laughs> compare slides, but I have a very similar one that the world is asking for, for system change, not only climate change, because we recognize this is the, the driver, the way we've set up our societies, our economies uh, are, you know, the reasons why we are facing the critical issues that we're facing today. Um, and young people are the ones demanding it. So I'm so you know, excited and why this community is so necessary because this generation is the one that's going to create the systemic change. So I'm I'm just so happy to be here. Um, what Peter referred to our book and kind of we started writing this book on systemic work and how to how to actually do the practice uh, of systems change rather than just talk about it and what needs to be done now. And we went down a rabbit hole of well, how the hell did we end up where we? ended up now in our approaches to social change. Uh, and it has very much been through kind of 18th, 19th and 20th century of uh, driven by an industrial mindset and driven by the kind of industrial military complex of how our organizations are built, how we approach goals, uh, how we consider performance, achievement, progress, outcomes, value. Um, and that the social and nonprofit sectors are part of that complex uh, in a way, a, 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 uh, an expression of it and also you know, deeply entrenched in it. Uh, but it also means we've had very linear thinking and all of us have grown up in education systems. Uh, and hopefully those of you who are younger than me have had education systems that perhaps have been slightly more open to thinking about producing human capital to, to be productive, right? As, as part of that system. Um, and so undoing the, the urge to fix things, undoing the urge to suddenly address problems immediately and take a technical or an engineering or a mathematical approach. Not that we don't need technical solutions, but we've realized technical solutions alone uh, are not getting us there. So um, I wanted to just pause for a minute and ask for uh, your inputs on, on Mentimeter um, of what you see here. So it's not the highest quality image, but hopefully you can see a gate and a field and a path. And I'll leave it at that and some things in the horizon. Uh, I'm gonna leave it up for a bit. And then Alice, I'll ask you when I need to stop, when we've got some answers on uh, the website to share. And I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Alice, if we can actually also get one or two people to talk. I don't know if, if, if the system's set up for that, but it might be interesting. Some people are putting in the chat. Yeah, we, yeah. Could, we could do, we'll just need to manually unmute you. Sure. The sky is having a good day. Thank you for that, Ivan. <laughs> in my little booth here, I'm not seeing much of the sky, so thanks for pointing it out. A solution that does little to solve the problem. Yes, indeed. Uh, perhaps I can ask, um, there's a fenceless gate and a guide for cattle um, and a solution that doesn't solve the problem. Um, there is a path. Ah, there we go. Oh, wonderful. Look at the system. Amazing. A gate, no fence opportunity. Can maybe... Maybe we can open up uh, someone who'd like to to speak to it. Um, the, a question: Why? What are the reasons that might be that clearly we have you know a gate that, for some reason, this path is trodden, which means people are still going through the gate despite that there's no fence. Does anyone want to contribute to ideas why? I've got a few hands up. Well, I'm going to let you run this part, Alice. Yeah, I will do so. Riti, I've just um, asked to unmute. Hello. <laughs> hi, hi. Um, 
if I'm not wrong, you outside people are still going through that gate. Why? So it's to be on a system, I guess. Follow the system because someone actually worked hard and made a system to to ask them to pass through the gate. So um, just following the system and trusting the person or the group who created mm. that system is the mm. reason. Mm. Great. Maybe let's get one or two more. Great comments. Karen, it looks really solid and it looks new. Um, I mean, it's not like it, it looks like a fence has fallen down around it. So mm -hmm. I wonder if there's some reason it's important to line something up before something starts. Like gates can be used as an obstacle to keep things in, but it could also mm -hmm. be used for timing or something like that. I've not heard that. I've shown this slide many times. I've never heard that. Thanks, Karen. Perfect. And then Ayush. Yeah. Uh from uh, this i can see that uh since uh there is a, a way and the road and there is fence so i think uh whoever built this fence they want the uh, people or cattle to go to the uh, to explore other way uh in uh, in contrast to the conven conventional way so maybe yeah thank you so to, so I'm also reading some of these and, and maybe, you know, if someone has a burning one, we, we can jump it, you know, put, put it in the chat, but I'm just reading a lot of these, these um, fantastic comments. And it's clear that, you know, that as the first uh, Pratiki, I think was her name, maybe I got that wrong, uh, was saying there's a system in place. There is a, there's a set of, of habits, right. That, that we follow what others do. We follow what has come before. Um, Karen was saying maybe that's actually a future signal, but in in many ways that we may go through the gate without thinking. Um, and maybe there's a someone wrote there's a gate that's left behind, right? So maybe they they used to be a, a fence, and maybe there's good reasons. Maybe there's line landmines in in the field, and maybe there's good reason to stay on the path. But maybe they're historical reasons that don't exist anymore, and yet we still use the gate. Um, and I think someone said, you know, we're I can't. It's it's gone on the on the on the website here, but you know we are the ones that are limiting our own viewpoint. Um, so these have been fantastic um, uh, contributions to show that there are there are rules that are visible and invisible. There are norms, uh, and there is historical reasons around why we live in the world we live in, why we do the things we do, what our behaviors are, and why we keep doing them. And why sometimes when it's obvious that there are other alternatives, we keep doing the same thing. So maybe I'll go back to my slides now. Um, and sorry, I haven't been able to keep up and read all the chat as well, but um, just, yeah, thank you just everyone for, for, for your contribution. So I'm sure there are a lot more reasons to, to, to comment on, um, but that's just to give us a little bit of a, a taste of um, what, we're, what we're gonna be delving into. So, you know, the big question for us um, is, is why do things stay the same? Um, and that there are, you know, structural and institutional reasons, so uh, as well as very personal reasons uh, around why there are norms and standards in society. Sometimes there are clear laws and policies, but sometimes there are cultural norms and sometimes there are stigmas uh, and ongoing behaviors that we don't question. And maybe now in certain, issues, we start to question them a lot more, but they're still difficult to change. I mean, if we're thinking about patriarchy, if we're thinking um, about uh, our habits and how we use uh, and consume uh, material objects. Um, but also that systems are, it's not only uh, up to individuals uh, to try and change them in a way, uh, many of us actually hold those systems in place ourselves. So there is an individual route to play, but we'll talk also about all of the other dimensions of it. But in a way there, we're all sometimes invested in, in keeping the status quo because change is hard. And particularly those who benefit from the current system, that those in power or those uh, along power hierarchies are of course resistant to change and you will have all experienced that in one form or another. So this is important kind of background, but as someone said, it depends on our point of view and we need to zoom out a little bit and think about, well, where have we got to in the world and you know what's happening in the world and we all seem to be huddled looking at ourselves um and despite all of our ambitions 
how are we not seeing the changes and the results that we want to see despite knowing what the problems are despite having many of the solutions technical solutions um but not being able to actually change uh, the outcomes or the ways that things work and so that's i think is a driver for this question around why is there a focus on how to do systemic work and why are we getting more and more interested in systems and systems change because it's clear that the ways we've been working despite knowing what the problems are we don't seem to be able to to change it um to to, to put in a little bit of just academic um work that uh, Don donella meadows um uh, was a canadian uh, academic who was um a very uh, influential in bringing uh, her work around systems thinking into the social sector um, and described a system as a, a set of interdependent and connected elements that are organized to achieve something um, and recognize and a lot of the learnings around systems and system thinking and applying that to human society was also in um, recognizing that we that we have natural systems that we've learned from so a lot of the learning has come from actual environmental ecosystems um sorry i'm struggling with my moving forward here there we go so um the one thing to recognize is that we we live and we we operate uh in complex systems and most of the social and environmental issues and challenges we see around us are complex systems uh, and complex systems are uh, in a way uh, made up of a set of dynamics uh, and those are so we have the, the the elements of the system but also the relationships between them right and the point is that if you're changing one aspect of a system an actor or a rule or um, an aspect of it that that changes in relationship with with other things one of the most easiest examples um, that uh, Brenda Zimmerman used of a complex system that we can all understand is a family uh, is a very good example of a fam of a of a complex system because I have two kids and the 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 way I raise my first child um, cannot necessarily be applied to the way I raise my second child. One because the individuals are very different, but two because when the second child came along, now there is a four person um, family system versus a three person one, and so it changes the the dynamic as well. Not to mention the the all of the individual variability of the individuals involved. Um, so I wanted to also come back to Mentimeter and get all of your uh, input again and ask you, since you were in an educational environment here, what makes up uh, an education system? What are the components that make up an education system? If you can think about, well, I won't say too much, well, the components and then you know the, the, the dynamics. Perhaps uh, we can get some, some thoughts from all of you on that, since you are all operating in some form of education system. And thanks for the cartoon, Alice. Grades, I love that. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not sure how, much, how many faculty are on here, but do feel free to jump in as well and don't be offended by the answers. Wow, suddenly getting very complex very quickly. Thanks everyone, this is already phenomenal. That word cloud was, was super helpful. So clearly there are some physical things, you know, buildings, physical infrastructure, um, the curriculum, there are knowledge components to it. There are obviously the grades there and <clears throat> then all of the people groups from government to um, exam boards, to teachers, principals, I haven't their students there and support staff and probably parents are in there somewhere as well communities and then of course the the rules right the admissions criteria um the exams uh and there are all the written rules and then there are probably a bunch of unwritten rules um in in authority in power structures in 
paying deference to academics who publish, to teachers who hold positions, to government officials, uh, et cetera. Um, and so thinking about, well, clearly, how do we change an education system suddenly becomes very, very complex. Um, and often the people who are most affected by it, uh, and we talk about in our book, the greatest point of complexity, which is in, in this situation, probably the interaction point between the teacher and the child because of all the dynamics uh, are probably, and often in education systems, the least able to influence the evolution, the progress, the decisions around how education system changes. That usually happens at many, many other levels. So um, this is great. And uh, you know, you're all part of it. So you're seeing all of these aspects, but also all the dynamics. And I think people refer, refer to flows, refer to um, decisions, um, refer to how uh, the interaction between the different actors and between the, the different components, whether it's students interacting with exams, or students interacting with parents, or students interacting with uh, the school system, um, makes for a, a very complex system. And so, thinking about you know solutions and where to intervene, uh, suddenly becomes uh, not as simple as oh, I see a gap there, let's just fix that, uh, because that's not necessarily going to change the reason why that problem exists in the first place. It may lie uh, somewhere else. So I'm going to come. Uh, I think we're okay for time maybe we can just are there any burning comments and people want to jump in and, and make a comment i'd be happy to pause for two minutes for that alice of course as before if anyone wants to say something yeah. if you put your hand yeah. up certainly welcome if there are any faculty also to mm -hmm. Okay, I, I might just then move on and oh, there we go. There's one, one hand. Neha. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Hello. Oh, I'm not sure Neha can hear us. Perhaps we should move on from. Can Smart. you hear us? Yeah, I can hear. I got some technical issues because of that. I just joined our class. Go so ahead. I think the most important component of an education system would be like a mission. Yeah. A commission? An education commission? Yeah, a mission. Did you say the mission or a commission? I, I didn't hear that. Properly. No, a mission, mission, a mission. mission. Like, yeah, something that drives them right. to motivate people to learn and grow yes. more. Yes. That's my like, opinion. Why, why it exists. I mean, that's fundamentally underlies that. And, and sometimes that mission is forgotten. Why did we build education systems in the first place? And, and, and sometimes it's implicit, right? We don't, it, it's not articulated what actually government or schools are trying to achieve. There are a few more hands. Should we take some other comments, Alice? Perfect. Uh, Nadu Anarin, Emmanuel, I've just asked you to meet. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Onarina from University of Venda. Um, the other important uh, component of education system is um, the knowledge holders in communities. Uh, the students learn from the knowledge holders and the knowledge holders learn from us through intergenerational learning system. Thanks. Thank you. And I think increasingly that, you know, wanting to bring those knowledge systems that exist outside of the curriculum uh, into schools is, is sometimes a, you know, a challenge. Uh, and, and let's move on. So let's take one or two more, Alice, and then I'll get going again. Fabulous. Uh, Puneeth. Hi, uh, I think that uh, the basic uh, component of the uh, education system is that uh, it decides the future of the world, right? So the uh, yeah. location where we live, because education is something uh, which also uh, incepts the thought uh, in a student's mind, uh, like, uh, and it also decides what kind of a citizen 
uh, he's going to be in the future. He or she is going to be in the future. So that is what I feel this. Thank you. One more, Alice. Great, I sure. Thank you. Um, I would say that one of the most important components of an educational system is definitely sort of the inherent value that it showcases itself to be for the reason that actually keeps the education system going. And I think that also sort of, um, you know, makes sense for other systems that are in place. Um, I think it's always important to question why they exist in the first place and what is that inherent value that it gives, um, whether it's teachers, whether it's students, um, any, anyone participating in that system, what is that value um, or that perceived value that they think they're getting out of that. Thank you. Value and values. Um, so thanks so much for that. I, I think we've all been probably part of systems, education systems that we know need to evolve and, and transform and, and reform. And that's part of a global debate around, you know, where is education going? How can it prepare our future? As um, uh, we had heard someone say, uh, but also how difficult that is to do, right? And why that's so difficult to do. And so when you look at kind of these systems and there's, there's maps and what everyone has said, it feels a little bit overwhelming to say, well, how the hell can I, as a student, as a young person, as a employee of a school system, uh, can change that? It's just, it feels so overwhelming. And so one of the, the challenges of coming into the space of, of, of thinking about systems change is when you start to understand systems and when you start to understand the scale and scope and the complexity of it all is to be overwhelmed. Right. And I think what Map the System does is gives you know an opportunity to, to look at that carefully and to start to understand that uh, there are points of intervention. Um, but understanding is the first step. Uh, and that it requires you know collective work of many to do that. So let's let's dig in a little bit to you know from systems to systems change. Um, and when we want to start to work towards that, it is about thinking about, well, you know, the change is not just for a few, but for everyone. Uh, and you heard Peter uh, Drobak talk about leverage points, right? And so you've identified some of these, these, the rules, the roles that people hold, the power they hold, the relationships, uh, the resources at play, all of those are potential leverage points to change from often a linear way. And so using the circular economy here as an example, um, to uh, to more circular uh, or something that is you know transformative and quite different from what existed before and so you know what are the points of of leverage is one of the questions that starts to emerge when doing system mapping when doing uh, explorations and research with a systems mindset and a system lens um, but often it is also below all of that as some people started to to identify is 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 what some of you refer to as mission or values or uh, mindset, which is really the paradigms. So these deep seated beliefs around why and how the system uh, exists, right? That, are, that, that really are quite intangible, um, but are the, the grounding point of uh, why systems express themselves the way they are. And so this is known as the iceberg model. So what we see, we see the gate, we see the path in the field and we see people walking through it. So things that are quite visible uh, and uh, tangible, uh, but often what actually holds all of that in place are uh, a set of intangible things. So that's why it's called the iceberg model because you don't see really what's under the surface. Um, so certain structures that might be there or might not be there that are holding it in place. Um, uh, but ultimately the, the paradigms of thought. So the people that just keep going through the gate thinking, okay, this must be the way to do it because everyone else has done it that way. Um, and uh, ultimately that iceberg model is also what we start to need to uncover and I'll bring it out in more detail now uh, around what holds certain systems in place. And so this is uh, another expression of that kind of inverted pyramid iceberg model um, and looking at explicit conditions that hold systems and systemic problems in place 
uh, and less explicit and implicit ones. So things like in an education system, the policies that say actually only faculty can teach. Well, what about, as we heard, uh, the communities? Why don't we learn from, from local communities in a formal way um, or from students themselves? You know, shouldn't they be setting the curriculum? Um, so different practices um, and then, you know, the, the resources the inputs into that system are all things that we can see that are explicit that we could tackle. Um, but underneath that, there are a set of power dynamics. So even if we said, okay, well, let's learn from communities and students and get them to set the curriculum, there is a set of actors whose jobs are at stake, who said, well, we've done PhDs in education, we know how education should be taught, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there are things that are perhaps less explicit, not written down anywhere, but actually very important to why a system works in a particular way. And of course, all of these things are also highly relational, the people involved and their relationships and connection. And ultimately then at the bottom of that is this mental model that oh, we've, particularly for those of us who've grown up in a particular education system, we replicate that because that has become our mental model of thinking, well, children must go through 12 grades of school. So I give you an example of kindergarten. When kindergarten was first introduced, I think over a hundred years ago, it was considered a wild idea, like why should kids need to be in school before they started school at the age of six? Um, and uh, nowadays we understand the research around early childhood development and early learning are critical years for what you can build on later. Um, and so now it's something we take fully for granted and we accept as an important stage in education and development. But at the time, it was it was shunned, it was excluded, it wasn't accepted, um, and uh, you know it was part of having to then transform mental models through years and decades of practice of research um, of of results. So it, just to give a bit of an example, but this is what we start to tackle when we start to think about well, how do we think about systems? What are the different components of them? Which of the ones that we can see? Which are the ones that are less visible? Which are the dynamics at play? And ultimately, what are we doing to actually, in our own minds and, in, and as a collective, to actually hold that system in place just because of the way we think? Um, I'm gonna give some examples. So that's like one of, of introducing kindergarten. Another one is um, uh, one from my own home country. And I think we have a few South Africans here and thinking about obviously the transition from apartheid to democracy, uh, but also um, women attaining the vote. Uh, I think the first country to allow um, women the vote was in 1904. If anyone knows the answer to that one on the chat or can correct my history, feel free to, to do that. Um, and right through to uh, a state in the country I currently live in, Switzerland, Appenzeller, that only gave women the vote in 1981. So it's been a long journey um, uh, for uh, the right to vote. Uh, but, you know, what took place and what was needed to get to that point required a change in the rules, the policies, uh, but also there were power, clear power dynamics at play. And underlying all of that were some very strong mental models and ways of thinking that have been around for thousands of years and obviously continue to today. Um, so these are a couple of examples you know, of quite big system changes. We can also give some, some examples that happen out at a local level, but I thought it'd be useful to just put that out there and also explore with you. And if you can give maybe some of your own examples, we can also see some of that because I'd love to hear. Uh, and they can also be uh, quite local examples that don't need to be um, at the scale that, that I've uh, shared with you here, but just to get us thinking a little bit in, in practical ways uh, and the different steps that were required uh, to actually get to those points. And I think the other realization as you're thinking about examples is that even, uh, at that moment of democracy and even at the moment of um, uh, equality in voting, um, that the, the, the journey didn't stop, right? We're seeing that around the world in terms of women's rights uh, and uh, the progress and actually the regress in, in some places, um, as well as the ongoing challenges in post-democracy South Africa in that there is not equality just because there was political equality. Um, so absolutely, we're seeing all kinds of disruptions, activism, challenges, issues that are being... Great, thanks for all of these. Yep, 
examples and hopefully you're all reading these and seeing them as well. Francois, Aaron Dunn has his hand up. Shall we start hearing yeah, yeah, take, from a couple of people and people can still enter Perfect. your answers on the Mentimeter at the same time? Super. Please let them. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. So for me, I think uh, the diversity inclusion in different companies right now is uh, like the uh, companies are doing it very in very like high rate. So that's a kind of system change. Uh, it's previously it's uh, it was kind of male dominating, but now most of the companies are looking for female candidates in higher positions. Even LGBTQ candidates are also they are welcoming at the moment. So that's a I think uh, a system change. Definitely, because it requires change in you know the policies, the relationships, the power, but also the mental models of the people working there. I might come back to that example. A bit later, let's uh, let some others come in. This perfect, Mauricio. Hi, can can you listen to me? Yeah, we Hi. can. So yeah, so the thing is, uh, one crazy experience. I have a trip to Bolivia uh, many years ago, and I have a local friend over there. And it was crazy. Uh, she told me when she was a kid, I mean, she's in her 30s and then early 1990s, early 2000s, uh, indigenous people wasn't allowed to go to restaurants and to um, grocery shops. Uh, so they were, you know, if they wanted to go to a restaurant to have some food, uh, they just kicked them out. Uh, this is in Bolivia. And it wasn't too long ago. It was like 20 years ago. Uh, until this new pressing came, uh, Evo Morales and all that thing, they start changing. But uh, for me, that's crazy because it's uh, Bolivia is a country with the vast majority of the population is indigenous, is native, and they were not allowed to use like very simple stuff like restaurants, grocery stores, and a lot of places. And this has changed. Uh, they have been more inclusive with them. They're more involved in politics and all that stuff. Of course, they still have a lot of work to do. Uh, but I think that's good. Like we are like more aware of these vulnerable communities, and we're like truly uh, a lot of societies around the world that are truly working for being more inclusive and bringing more into the the social work. But yeah, that's it. Yes, yes, thank you. Should we take one more? Uh -huh. Perfect. So I've just asked Abraham if you. Happy to go. Yes, uh, I'm Abraham from Liberia, West Africa. And in the chat, and I, I put the slavery in the US to diversity visa. So um, I think it's a system change. Uh, uh, during the Atlantic slave trade, people were brought forcibly work in plantations in the US uh, from nothing. But uh, with the diversity visa program, you can apply and come by yourself and work and earn something, but the same uh, kind of a work and stuff like that. So I think that's a system change. Oh, thanks so much, Abram. Okay, I, I know that I'm um, gonna run out of time relatively soon. So this has really been, I actually would be great to, to keep these at us. I mean, there's so many rich examples here uh, at so many levels. I, I think also what you'll see is that each system doesn't operate in a total vacuum. They're interdependent and connected to other systems. So all the examples we've heard here seem to be connected to other dynamics going on. Um, one of the things I wanted to kind of recognize is that um, many of these um, examples that have been given um, have been, how they've been approached and how they've been worked on seem to have been, but maybe that's not entirely true, but seem to have been the realm of activism. The realm of activism alone and that's not entirely true um because obviously there were people working on technical aspects there were people uh doing quiet diplomacy there were people working on legal action uh there were people also coming up with alternative solutions and that's obviously the space of, of social innovation um so uh the other thing and i wanted to come back to the one example of you know diversity and inclusion in companies is to also say they've also been driven by people who not always necessarily in positions of power so in a company maybe it was 
the CEO or the board that decided, okay, we need a diversity and inclusion, equity and inclusion strategy, and they start to roll that out. But many of the times, uh, it's also been driven by uh, individual people not in positions of power, who found those leverage points, who found uh, actors and allies to work with. And it's also a great encouragement from all of us when I talked about feeling overwhelmed sometimes when thinking about system is also to see, you know, that I think it's a quote by Margaret Mead who said, you know, never uh, doubt that a small group of people can't change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. So also to think that some of these things have started by people, you know, in unlikely places and not necessarily in positions of formal authority or power, but have been able to lead to, to great things. So, um, that's an encouragement, I think, for, for all of us. Um, I'm just going back to my uh, slides and I'm just gonna show, get back to a little bit of some definitional work and then I'm gonna share a couple of tools like Greta Thunberg. Thank you so much, exactly. I'm just sitting outside of school on a, on a, on a regular Friday. Um, so this is from, is it more pragmatic? And I don't really generally like to put definitions out there because there are so many different definitions and I think it's a concept we're still working on uh, together. Um, but it comes from a report that we, we wrote with the Skoll Foundation and, and many others, uh, Catalyst 2030, I think Skoll Center was involved and we were involved to think about, you know, summarizing what are the dimensions of uh, and components of systems change work which addresses, talking about addressing root causes rather than the symptoms of it, uh, altering, shifting, transforming structures, customs, mindsets, power dynamics, rules, the things we've been talking about, uh, but requires collaboration across different actors uh, that lead to shifting paradigms uh, and the capacity to change uh, with the intent of long lasting social change, societal change at local, national, and governmental level. So it's a nice little, definition that tries to capture all of these complex things in, in one space and I find it quite useful to come back to to say are we just fixing a problem or are we trying to shift the way the system works and in what ways and sometimes you know the solutions that fix problems can do that but sometimes the solutions that we think are fixing problems also help to perpetuate the status quo and perpetuate those in power or perpetuate ways that things are done so having a systemic approach, doing the map the system work helps us be mindful of, well, if we're going to start coming up with solutions and interventions, let's be, let's test it again in some of these components to see, well, to what degree is it doing these things. I was going to just, second part, which was just going to run through a couple of the tools, and you're going to have a lot of tools in the map the system resources are truly amazing. Uh, I've been through that uh, resource book several times. Um, but a couple of things that are used in this space um, may or may not be helpful on the journey. And again, you can get super sophisticated about it, but you can also use kind of simplified ways of doing it. Um, and, you know, and the good old Albert Einstein quote that we can't solve the problems with the same thinking or the same tools that we used when we created them. Um, you know, we're not lacking the solutions, but the ability to transform. So one is social innovation labs. And ultimately, I'm seeing Map the System in this community as a kind of global lab. Right, and, and social innovation labs are um, processes that involve multiple people from different stakeholder groups. Um, in this case, you know, different students, different groups to come together, maybe from different disciplines uh, to actually work together to build a systemic understanding and then develop solutions together, which is essentially the process of, of Map the System. Uh, but these are used in different forms, kind of sometimes quite formally, um, I've been working a bit more closely with a group called Project Together in Germany that has 60,000 young people working with government on developing citizen-based solutions for, for climate issues, for democratic political issues. So very interesting how these can be used very locally in small groups to actually very large uh, practice. I won't necessarily go through all of this, but you know, I can I can share I can share the slides um, around how social innovation labs works, but I wanted to talk so they're tools that are processes you know that we facilitate that with the way in which we work together then there are mapping um tools um where you can start to to actually do some ecosystem mapping of the different resources roles dynamics relationships um and kind of what they lead to um i'm gonna just go quickly through all this stuff because i don't think it's super helpful uh, there are different canvases like you've got business model canvases there's social innovation lab canvases then our system map, map canvases um 
and there are all kinds of different projects you know that can be done in the space so again i'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on it um i'll speak for literally one slide about the work that i've done in in, in the book uh, the systems work of social change that really looked at how look because a lot of you are working in in your local context and um cities in the world um that uh, what we looked at was how systemic change happens, but also how it is driven locally, um, and how and our true belief and our, our, our I guess our thesis in in this work was that while we can have policy changes unless that is really driven by the lived experience uh, and is participatory in a way, um, that we won't ultimately get. The kinds of changes we want in the world so i'll give you a quick example i mean i sit now at the world economic forum clearly seeing a large transition happening uh, around the green economy around the digital economy and you're all seeing that in the world but uh the one risk is that the actors of power who are were who are actors of power in our current economy and who benefit our current economy are the key actors that are starting to shape and drive the digital and green transitions as well um, and so how do we start to bring different voices, participation, decision-making, uh, and, and participation and bene beneficiation in those transitions? Um, and that's partly what we looked at is, is the challenges in the world, those who tackle complex challenges, how do they do it? What are the actual principles and practices of how these organizations work? And it's really around three major principles around building relationships and connection, understanding and embracing local context and reconfiguring the, the power and patterns. Uh, and the practices are a set of practices that lie below those principles, each with a set of tactics uh, around building collectives, around uh, equipping people who work uh, and engage with the issues on the front line, building platforms for power, um, and ultimately engaging and disrupting uh, policies and patterns that exist. So. I won't go too much more into that. And if you're interested in it, uh, um, you can certainly share uh, the book's uh, summaries and it's available on Kindle as well. So, um, but there are a couple of principles that also came out of the work we did with that report on embracing complexity, which was um, to understand that how partners, funders, actors can better work in and support system change efforts. So that's embracing this mindset uh, supporting multiple different pathways rather than thinking about one solution. We're working in true partnership with each other, preparing for longer term work uh, and collaborating with a whole set of other stakeholders in the process. Um, and that ultimately we've also got to reflect on our own practices, right? What are, what are the things that we are responsible for and are participating in and are uh, continuing to, to perpetuate? And what are the things we need to change in ourselves? So part of this is an internal reflection journey as well. And Maybe that's getting too deep at this stage of the game, but it would be uh, not right to not mention that you know there is a personal journey as well, which is a very enriching uh, and uh, growth journey, I think, for all of us. So uh, that's it from me, uh, Anna, Peter, and everyone in the audience. I think you know just a big thanks for for letting me share some thoughts. Uh, this work with the Skoll Center has certainly influenced the way that I work and think, and uh, and. The, you know, the learning has come from other people and, and the community. So just great to be able to be here and, and interact with all of you. So uh, thanks so much, Alice. Thank you, Francois, for being here. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, so the next stage, I was going to go a little bit through kind of next steps, um, live sessions. But before we do that, did anyone have any burning questions for, for Francois or Peter before we move on? I'd just like to jump in and thanks. I see some hands going up. <clears throat> um, just to, to, to thank you, Francois. And one thing I, I would love to highlight from um, from your presentation is the um, the humility with which both you presented the work, um, and I think that's embedded in the way you even talk about the work and uh, you know the the systems work of social change rather than systems change, etc. Um, it's an important. Uh, it's an important um, characteristic and trait that I think we need to cultivate within ourselves and understanding that we don't come in with all the answers. We're not coming to try to solve problems. We're coming to try to um, to connect and equip in solidarity and learn together. And it's about the it's about the journey, not the destination. And so I think that um, you 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 carry yourself as a real systems leader. I think that humility is a huge part of it, and would encourage all of us to cultivate that in our work. Um, so thanks. 
Thank you, Peter. Wonderful. Mitter, uh, I will ask you to unmute. Yes, uh, I have just a short question uh, with regards to iceberg model. Uh, with uh, my uh, local educators, we don't have uh, resource flows in our iceberg model. And my question is, uh, what exactly mean resource flows in your iceberg model? Can you just tell some examples, maybe? Yeah, sure. That's a good good question. And sorry, you know, sometimes using language that I use often, and then that's not always self-explanatory. So, um, uh, so different kinds of resources could be money, could be knowledge, uh, could be um, you know, people even, right? But I think if we think about money and knowledge, uh, how that uh, how that moves from one of these actors, nodes, etc., to another, um, and kind of built into that are opportunities for change, right? So how money gets distributed. So an obvious example, let's say, funding or investment. Um, so take investing into social enterprises in Africa. I don't remember what the statistic is, but more than 80% of that goes to kind of white-led social enterprises of expats living somewhere in the world with connections back to uh, funders. So that's a kind of very obvious example of resource flows and an opportunity for change, um, but also something that is perpetuating a system in the social enterprise space around who, uh, who benefits and who gets to be you know, working on helping people and who needs help, right? So it perpetuates all of those kind of colonial um, ideologies in how resources flow. And you can think about the same in how information flows, who has access to what information, right? Those kinds of things, transparency, budgeting processes, the whole process of participatory budgeting, like how that happens and who gets uh, allocation to things. So uh, that's some examples and hopefully that's been helpful. Wonderful. We had a few more hands up. Um, Marisha, because you spoke earlier, I'm going to come to Sebastiano, if that's OK, first. Hi. Uh, um, yeah, this is a question for, for both of you. I'm just wondering, how do you use systems thinking in your day to day life? Like what how has it changed? You know what you do on a daily level and how does it, you know, translate then into your work? Um, yeah. That's a really good question. Uh, sorry, who who was it who asked the question? I didn't. Sebastiano. Sebastiano. Oh, thanks, Sebastiano. Sorry, I, I didn't see the video. Uh, I mean, sure, Peter can jump in here as well. Uh, first of all, to say you catch yourself thinking in the old ways every day. <laughs> right? I've got a problem with primary, I just need to fix it. Uh, so, you know, I think that's just the, the, the reality of how one's mental model has been created over one's life and certainly my life uh, the other is to sometimes be overwhelmed and just go where the hell do we even start and the other is to start trying to do systemic work and i've been doing that using the platform i have here and recognize even with an intentionality to do systemic work it ends up being linear work uh, and and the compromises along the way because it just always forces you in that way um, so it's a flawed process maybe that's the first thing to say um, but secondly, it's also like really exciting because you have to work with so many people in different ways and have to listen to you know different ways of seeing and thinking about things. Um, so I think humility gets forced upon you, Peter, when you start working like this. Um, but for me, it's really exciting, um, but it brings a level of awareness. And some of that is through the readings that make you think differently. Some of that is just being able to look at what one does every day and, and look at it with a different angle. But it's really helped if you're doing that with others. So this is why I guess this process and this competition is, is exciting. Wonderful, thank you. We have a couple more questions. Rishi? Ah, uh, so hi. So one question, Francois. Um, you have the option of uh, uh, two scenarios one you can do a major change but it will affect a small community or a very very small change in the system but it will affect like a lot of people like almost globally which one do you think it will be more valuable or worthy to focus the effort a small change a big change sorry but in a small community or a very very small change but a 
that affects a lot of people. Where do you find these students around the world, Peter? They're putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my, my seven-year-old loves to play the game, would you rather? Would you, you rather? Know, like, would you rather, you know, eat slime or like walk over hot coals or whatever? This is, this is a better <laughs> choice, but no less difficult. Go ahead, Francois. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'm a proponent of small change is big change. Uh, that very local changes can have ripple effects across the world. Uh, and so that is very powerful and tempting to go with that answer. Um, but obviously one can, you know, take a big change in a small community and be extremely powerful. I, I, I you know, yeah, <laughs> impossible choice. <Yeah. laughs> I, I think both are necessary, right? So but probably because where I'm interested in is looking at how small changes really have ripple effects across many different spaces. Um, sometimes those start in one local community, right? And, and I think that's also encouraging to think about that. So I didn't give you, I gave you a very like academic diplomatic answer. So sorry for the, <laughs> sorry for the cop. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Wonderful, thank you. So what I might do now, because we're getting towards the end of time, is just show you some resources I have. And then if we've got a bit of time left over, we can take some more questions at the end. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you could answer this poll quickly, just to help me know roughly how many of you are get got to Canvas fine, who's maybe struggling a little bit. It will just help me um, know what we need to focus on. Okay. Quite a few of you got on. It looks like some of you could do with a little bit extra help, which is completely fine. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to show you is the um, upcoming live sessions for um, Matt and the System. If you can all see that. Uh, so on this page, everyone that's successfully logged into Canvas, you'll see we've got uh, our live workshops listed. Um, so obviously we've now had our first session. Thank you for joining us. And then from next week, we have a couple of different slots on framing your problem. Um, those will be delivered by our educator here at the, the University of Oxford, um, Anna Jani. And then there is also the Map System Canada team also running a separate session on systems thinking, uh, particularly for anyone that might be watching this recording, wanting a little bit of extra detail on that. And then later in February, we've got two sessions coming up on causal loop mapping. And that's one of the main tools that most people tend to use on Map the System. We do keep it very fluid. You can apply your own tools, but that is a particularly helpful one for, for this project. And on the second page, you can see we've got more things coming up into March. Uh, the Map System Canada team are also running a session on colonial influences and in systems, particularly looking um, at Indigenous rights. And um, it will have a focus on Canada, but it will be applicable to any context that you're in. And then going into March, we have a session on solutions mapping and landscaping. And what we mean by that is starting to look at things that might have already been tried um, in or attempted to solve the systemic problem that you're looking at. Uh, that will be delivered by uh, Cynthia Rayner, who was the co-author of Francois's book. So we're so happy to have them both part of Map System. And then at the end of March, we have uh, another session on visual storytelling, and we'll also have a couple of sessions on systems interventions. So that comes right at the end of your project. That's once you've done your analysis, you have a good understanding of the different stakeholders involved. You've looked at different um, solutions that might have been attempted. And right at the end of your project, we ask you to propose an intervention. Um, not a solution, because with these complex problems, it's unlikely that we can find a solution, but it's a positive intervention based on your research. But that's right at the end. So just forget about that for now. At the moment, it's really about delving into the problem. On the same page, you'll also see we have added details on our office hours. We will start those from next Friday. 
Those will happen twice a week and they are run by our Matlab system tutors. We have five wonderful tutors who help us on the program. They, most of them were involved last year and they've all been involved in supporting the Oxford uh, GoTo program, which is part of the MBA course here. And they're very experienced in supporting students through this type of project. Uh, the way it will work is you just come along, either you have a question in mind or you just want to come and hear what everyone else is struggling with. Um, and often once you come listening to others, you will actually start to realize, oh, I, I've been struggling with that. Or it will, it will launch other ideas in your mind. It's just very helpful to attend. Uh, and we run those at two different times a week, generally morning and afternoon UK time to try and work for as many time zones as we can. Um, our friends in Australia, it's always the hardest to accommodate, but hopefully the morning slot is, is the better one for you. Um, so we'd love to see you there. So if you, um, through the Canvas site, you'll be able to register for the office hours and the live workshops. You just click on each of the titles and then you register via Eventbrite. Wonderful. Uh, so I wanted to, um, if everyone, would like, look like most people wanted a bit of an overview of Canvas. I've created just a little walkthrough um, that I will play to you now. Just check that my audio is on. So. that already uploaded onto the site. I just want So when you are invited to Canvas, you will receive an email from us which tells you your login information and some steps on to help you do that successfully. So you'll be navigated to this link where you should always click on the green participants tab. You'll then be prompted to enter in your email and auto-generated password, which will be in the login instructions. I'm just using my test account uh, for you in this example. So once you log in, for the first time you do this, you will see a QR code and uh, you will be asked to scan that. The best way to do that is by downloading an authentication app. I would recommend using Microsoft or Google Authenticator. When we send you the login instructions, you will also find a link to additional step-by-step -step guidance on how to set this up if you haven't used an authentication app previously. Uh, so for me, I've set this up previously. So I'm just going to enter in my code, which has appeared on my Microsoft app. Once you log in, you should have your dashboard where you'll see the map the system course. But you'll then see the home page. That would be a great place for you to start. On here, you'll see we've got lots of key links to help you navigate quickly. Welcome information. So we have this coming up next section, um, which will continue to update every week to tell you about what's coming up next. So we've got a series of workshops coming up over the coming weeks and months. And and um, for all of those, you'll register via Eventbrite. So you'll see on Canvas, we collate all the information for you to easily be able to find this. If you also scroll down on the home page, you'll find we have this helpful welcome video that uh, Peter helpfully created for us. Peter introduces you to map the system, also walks through the, the phases that I um, mentioned to you um, a minute ago in a bit more detail. And then helpfully, um, I would definitely recommend watching the video because Peter gives you some top tips for getting started with the foundation phase, uh, which is the phase that you're in now. So he gives you some kind of really tangible helpful advice for you to use to get started uh, so definitely check that out and uh, please make use of the canvas page you'll see we've got quick shortcuts here we've got a welcome page which tells you about how to use the canvas site the kind of main navigation in Canvas. Uh, you have the modules page, which is where all of the learning material appears. You'll see we have the live workshop series page. And if you continue looking at this page, you'll see we'll continue to add upcoming workshops 
and office hours. If we go back to the module page, we also have this helpful section on navigating Canvas, which we recommend if you are not already a user of Canvas. In particular, check your notification preferences so you can tailor how often you want to receive updates from us. And we then have some more kind of introductory content about what is Map the System, how it works, and also we have uh, key dates for you to refer to to make sure you're clear on what's coming up when and uh, finally the content is then broken down into the phases so we'd recommend looking at this section on research tips and ethics and then you'll see in the preparation phase we've got some key resources about the different themes you can look at past projects in the foundation phase we've got tips about selecting your topic um, finding your problem focus an introduction to systems thinking and systems change. And you'll find lots of helpful reading and resources relating to this, different video content and things you can watch to really help you get started. You'll then see we have the flare phase content, um, which we'll expect you to get onto kind of mid-February onwards. And then we also have the focus phase. You wouldn't expect you to really begin the focus phase until March time. We'd also recommend that you have a look at the evaluation criteria. This is extremely detailed. You can read exactly about the expectations that we have in your projects and you can see there is very detailed criteria and each of these bullet points is worth five marks. So it's really helpful to look at that to think ahead of what you need to consider in your projects. So another couple of things to say is that we have our discussion board. This is open to all participants. So we'd really welcome you to come and chat on here. And um, we'll also have different discussions throughout the time. And you should be able to also create your own discussions just so you can have your own conversations and connect with, there are thousands of students from all over the world on this program. On the announcements tab, uh, we tend to send regular updates at least once a week about key things coming up. And you should receive an email notification once we send those. And uh, on the recordings tab, where you can see um, previous videos that are already uploaded onto the site and any future sessions we have, you'll also be able to find here. Perfect. Another function you can use in Canvas is the search function, uh, where you can search for um, some specific content that you might be really looking for um, for example here and then it will bring you to the page that you might be looking for another place that i would recommend navigating to is your groups area here you will see your university group and in there you'll be able to um, chat and discuss with any of your fellow students at your institution and also connect with educators there Another place to check is the calendar where you'll see today's session is in there and also the upcoming sessions next week. And you'll continue to find those during the time using Canvas. Um, so as you can see, there's lots of different areas um, where you can refer to content on Canvas. Um, so we wish you the best of luck and thank you so much. Thank you for listening to me. Hopefully that was helpful for those of you that um, are a little bit less familiar with Canvas and continue to let us know if you're particularly struggling to log in. Um, and myself and Callum are here to support you. Um, so we're almost at time. I just had a couple other um, things to raise and then Peter is going to close off the session for us. One sec, sorry, this one.
Perfect. So many of you have already chosen your topic, but obviously as you begin your research, you might find that you need to tweak this slightly. Um, so something we just wanted to highlight is that we have four kind of broad themes on Map the System, health, climate, economic and social. And these are just there to provide some additional inspiration. And also we have some um, specific resources on the Canvas site to help you um, with if you want to focus on any of these. Um, so on the Canvas site, this is just a screen recording. You can see we've got some specific information about each of these. And then also what we have done is we've highlighted all the previous finalists that had a project in one of these areas. Um, so that would be helpful for you to look through even just to, as a reference point, uh, but you shouldn't feel confined by these themes. It's just really there to help you. Uh, so next slide. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to show you on Canvas is this page on selecting and refining your topic, which could also be helpful. There are just some tips if you're kind of struggling with a few ideas or perhaps you've got an idea you think it's maybe too broad. Um, and also, please do come along to the Framing Your Problem workshops next week where we'll delve into this in more detail. We'll do an activity together and break our rooms. And the final thing I wanted to say is in addition to the um, office hours and live sessions coming up soon, which we should be able to share with you next week, is that we'll also be able to offer some one-to-one -one support with our tutors. Um, obviously, there are thousands of students involved in Map the System, so we can't necessarily support every team. Uh, so this support is really there for anyone who is that perhaps an institution that's new to map the system or you there are so many teams at your institution and your educator perhaps has a little bit less time um, to support you so this is an external perspective these are people that are very experienced in helping students with these type of projects you can come along share your screen you say I'm stuck with this part of the project or you just want some someone else to to speak to for another um, point of view and we had really good feedback on those last year. So once we announce those, please do take up that opportunity. Great. So thank you for listening, everyone. Um, apologies, we're at time. Peter's just going to close. Um, I'll speak to you all soon.